Hi everyone, I'm John Haddad. And I am Luke Tillman. And we're technical evangelists with Datastax. Today we're gonna to be talking about an introduction to Cassandra. During the talk today, we're gonna to cover uh, a few things. So first we'll talk a little bit about relational databases, maybe some of the problems that you run into when you try to scale relational databases for high availability. Then we'll also cover some core concepts of Cassandra, how Cassandra works internally, some of the dials that it gives you as a developer to kind of control its fault tolerance and uh, this, this notion of high availability. And then lastly, we'll kind of talk about the different distributions that you can choose of Cassandra. So is open source Apache Cassandra right for you? Or should you maybe think about using uh, Datastax Enterprise Distribution, DSE, when you're deploying Cassandra to production? First thing that we're gonna talk about is small data. This is when you've got maybe data in text files or on a small SQLite database, and you're gonna be using utilities like SED and awk uh, in order to analyze this. Maybe you whip up a Python script or something in Ruby, but in the end, it generally means that it's a one-off and you don't need any concurrency. You're not sharing this with anybody. Uh, this is running on your laptop and it's okay. Like maybe the batch takes like 30 seconds if it's a really, really big file, but that's kind of what you're looking at with small data. We've talked about small data, so let's talk about medium data now. So probably if you're a web application developer or you're a web developer of some kind, this is probably the typical data set that you're working with. So this is data that fits on a single machine. You're probably using a relational database of some kind, uh, maybe MySQL or Postgres, that kind of thing. You can support hundreds of concurrent users, so you've got some concurrency going on now. And the other kind of nice thing that we get when we're working with a relational database is these ACID guarantees. ACID standing for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And as a developer, uh, we've been taught for many years how to develop on top of uh, machines like this. So when I go to put data into a relational database with these ACID guarantees, I can kind of feel warm and cuddly and I kind of know exactly what's going to happen with my data when I put it in. The other thing to know about is the way we try to scale these typically first is by scaling vertically. So we buy uh, more expensive hardware, like more memory or maybe a bigger uh, processor, that kind of thing. And this can get expensive really, really quickly. The question we'll now ask ourselves is, can the relational database work for big data? The first thing that we find when we start to use a relational database to try and apply it to big data is that ACID is a lie. We're no longer enveloped in that cocoon of safety, uh, which is atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So let's take our scenario over here. We have a single master and we have a client that's talking to that master. And we have a read heavy workload and what we do is we decide to add on replication. So one of the things that's important to know about replication is that the data is replicated asynchronously and this is known as replication lag. And so what happens is when the client decides to do a write to the master, it takes a little while to propagate over to the slave. And if the client decides to do a read to the slave before the data has been replicated, it's gonna get old data back. And what we find is that we have lost our consistency completely uh, in the scope of our database. So that whole thing that we built our entire application around, that certainty that we had that we were always gonna get up-to-date data is completely gone. All the operations that we do are no longer in isolation. They're definitely not atomic. So we have to recode our entire app to take advantage or at least to accommodate the fact that we have replication and there is replication lag. Another thing that we run into when we start to deal with performance problems on our relational databases is something like maybe this query that you see on the right side of the slide here. So probably most of us that have worked with the relational database see these crazy queries with lots of joins. Uh, maybe it's being generated by an ORM uh, behind the scenes kind of thing. In fact, at a company I used to work for, uh, we had this problem where every day at one o'clock we'd have a lot of users try to log onto the system and nobody would be able to log in. And when we actually went and looked at what was going on behind the scenes, it was some crazy queries like this with lots of joins essentially locking up the database behind the scenes. So queries like this can cause lots of problems. Um, it's kind of one of the side effects of using third normal form to do uh, all of our data modeling. And so what we try to do when we're dealing with queries like this that uh, have unpredictable performance or poor performance a lot of times is we denormalize. So we'll create a table and uh, that table is built specifically to answer that query. So at right time, what we'll do is uh, denormalize at write time, maybe write that data into that table uh, specifically so that at read time we can do a sort of a select star, a very simple query that doesn't have a lot of expensive joins in it. And that means that now we've probably got duplicate copies of our data and we've kind of violated this sort of third normal form that we're used to uh, using and that has been drilled into our heads as developers for a really long time. As we continue to scale our application, the next thing that we're going to have to do is implement sharding. Sharding is when you take your data and, and instead of having it all in one database and one master, you split it up into multiple databases. And this works okay for a little while. 
The big problems with this is that now your data is all over the place. And even if you were relying on, let's say, a, a single master to do your OLAP queries, you can't do it anymore. All of your joins, all of your aggregations, all that stuff is history. You absolutely cannot do it. And you have to keep building different denormalized views of the data that you have in order to answer queries efficiently. We also find that as we start to query secondary indexes, that doesn't scale well either. So if we take our servers and we say, I'm going to split my users into four different shards, and then I haven't uh, sharded users on something like state, and I want to do a query. I want to say, I want all the users in the state of Massachusetts. That means I have to hit all of the shards. This is extremely non-performant. means if there was 100 shards, I have to do 100 queries. This does not scale well at all. Uh, as a result, we end up denormalizing again. So now we store two copies of our users, one by user ID and another by state. Whenever we decide to add shards to our cluster, if we want to double the number from four to eight, we now have to write a tool that will manually move everything over. This requires a lot of coordination between developers and operations and is an absolute nightmare because there's dozens of edge cases that can come up when you're moving your data around. So you have to think about all of them in your application and your ops team has to be aware of them as well. The last thing that we find is that managing your schema is a huge pain. If you have 20 shards all with the same schema on it, you have to now come up with tools to apply schema changes uh, to all of the different shards in your system. And remember, it's not just the master that has to take it, but all of your slaves. This is a huge burden. It is an absolute mess. Uh, at the end of the day, you look like this guy on the phone, like he's just absolutely out of his mind. Earlier, John mentioned using uh, master-slave replication to kind of scale out when you have a read-heavy workload. Another reason why people will introduce this sort of master-slave architecture with replication is for high availability or maybe higher availability. Uh, the thing is, when you, when you introduce this replication, a lot of times you have to decide how you're going to do the failover. So maybe you build some sort of automatic process uh, to do the failover. Uh, maybe it's a manual process where somebody has to notice that the database has gone down and push a button to fail over to the, the slave server. If you build an automatic process of some kind, then what's going to watch the automatic process to make sure it doesn't crash and ultimately not end up being able to fail over your database? And in any scenario, the, the problem is that you still end up with downtime because whether it's a manual failover process or an automatic failover process, that implies that it's something's going to have to detect that the database is down and that you're having downtime before the failover can kick in. The other thing is that trying to do this with a relational database and do multiple data centers is a disaster. It's really, really uh, hard to do. And we're not just talking about downtime as far as unplanned downtime. Um, you know, uh, we know that hardware fails. Uh, Amazon reboots your servers as a service sort of thing. Uh, that kind of stuff happens. But then there's also planned downtime as well. So there's things like uh, OS upgrades or upgrades to your database server software. Uh, so you've got to plan for those as well. So it'd be really nice to have some way to have higher availability uh, than what the master-slave kind of architecture uh, gives to us. Let's summarize the ways that the relational database fails us handling big data. Uh, we know that scaling is an absolute pain, right? We want to put bigger, bigger hardware that costs a lot of money. We want a shard, that's an absolute mess. We've got replication, it's falling behind. We have to keep changing our application to account for the things that we give up in the relational database. ACID, you know, that cocoon of safety, we're not in that thing anymore. We are basically treating our relational database pretty much like a glorified key value store. We know that when we want to double the size of our cluster, and we have to reshard. That is an absolute nightmare to deal with. Nobody wants to do this. It requires way too much coordination. We know that we're going to have to denormalize. All of our cool third normal form queries that we love to do, our aggregations, those things that we were so proud to write in the first place, they're gone. Now we're just writing our data in a bunch of different tables. And I mean, some of the times we're just going to JSON serialize it and whatever. Uh, it's an absolute disaster. High availability, it's not happening, right? If you want to do multi DC with MySQL or Postgres, it is absolutely not happening unless you have an entire dedicated engineering team to try and solve all of the problems that are going to come up along the way. So if we were to take some of the lessons that we've learned, uh, you know, some of the points of failure that John just summarized, and apply it to a new database, if we were trying to build something maybe from scratch um, that would kind of be good for handling 
uh, big data, what are some of the lessons that we've learned from those that failure? So the first thing is that consistency is not practical. This whole idea of, of acid consistency, probably not practical in a big distributed system. So we're gonna give it up. Uh, we also noticed that manual sharding and rebalancing is really hard, right? We had to write a lot of code just to move data from place to place and handle all these error conditions. So instead, what we're gonna do is push that responsibility to our cluster. Our dream database can go from three to 20 machines, and we as developers don't have to worry about it. We don't have to write any special code to accommodate that. Next thing we know is that every moving part that we add to the system, so this idea of master-slave replication that we get in a lot of databases, uh, that makes things more complex and all this failover and processes to watch the failover and everything. So we want our system to be as simple as possible, as few moving parts as possible, none of this master-slave architecture sort of thing. We also find that scaling up is really expensive. If you wanna vertically scale your database, you're gonna to have to put things like a SAN in place, you're gonna to have to get bigger and bigger servers. Every time you do it, it's more and more expensive. It's a lot of money and it's really not worth it in the end. Uh, so what we would do in our dream database is to only use commodity hardware. We wanna spend five, ten thousand dollars per machine instead of a hundred thousand dollars. And what we wanna do is buy more machines. That way, when we wanna double the capacity of our cluster, we're not going from a hundred thousand dollar machine to a two hundred thousand dollar machine. We're just doubling the number of cheap machines that we use. The sort of last lesson learned here is that scatter gather queries are not gonna be any good. So uh, we wanna have something that kind of tries to push us, uh, maybe in its data modeling or something like that, towards uh, data locality where queries will only hit a single machine so that we're efficient. We don't introduce a whole bunch of extra latency where we're, uh, instead of doing a full table scan, now we're doing a full cluster scan sort of thing. Thank you.